What is up, ladies and gentlemen? It is your boy, Smoothie, but of course, welcoming you back to the Mind of Smoothie podcast. It feels so good to be back once again, bringing you a fresh episode for your ear holes. And I want to just take a few seconds here, a few moments, if you will, to say thank you to all who took the time to check out last week's episode, who continue to give me criticisms, very constructive criticisms, that is, uh, ways to improve the show. Those who took the time to share it on your socials and just to help me out, because it, it does help me out a lot. And I wouldn't do it without you. I was going to use the phrase, couldn't do it without you, but I physically can do it without you. But without the support, and without people listening and paying attention to it, I wouldn't do it. Because what would be the point? So thank you. And I love you for that. Speaking of love, it is that time of year again. We are in the month of February and we are right around the holiday of Valentine's Day. Now, you may be listening to this episode on the actual day of Valentine's Day. You may be listening to it the day before, the day after. Whenever you're listening to it, we're still within the realm of Valentine's Day. So I want to say happy Valentine's Day to you and to your sweetheart out there if you have one. If not, happy Singles Awareness Day. When I think of Valentine's Day, I think of one I go all the way back to grade school to a little paper, Valentine's with different characters like Mickey Mouse or, I don't know, Donald Duck, Bugs Bunny, whoever may have been there, movie stars at the time, whatever. Always a fun time exchanging them. And one thing I've noticed that they do nowadays that they never did, or maybe just my school never did or we never did as kids, making cool little Valentine's box boxes where the kids just put your Valentine's in there. I think the reason why we didn't do that back in the day was because nowadays... We're tr we try to create a culture of um, acceptance. We don't want people's or kids' feelings to get hurt. So it's easier for everyone just to put their Valentine's in there so you can't see that you may or may not be getting a Valentine's Day, I guess. If that makes sense. And so nobody's feelings are hurt during class or nobody's embarrassed even. I know back in the day it was never really a big thing. At least I'm sure people's feelings did get hurt, but it wasn't as big of a thing where, you know, if you didn't get a Valentine's Day... It it happens because you weren't necessarily friends with everyone. Such is life, and we move on, but that's one of the things I think of. Also, conversation hearts. I mean, what a better way to say I love you than with a little piece of chalky tasting candy. And apparently I was doing some research on conversation hearts. They were not made. I take that back. Different companies still made conversation hearts last year, but the ones that like, the originators, the Sweethearts brand by the Nico Neco, N-E-C-C-O candy company, they were not produced last year, or maybe that was in 2018 they weren't produced. I may have been reading, still processing that we're in a new decade and a new year. But whatever the case, they took a hiatus, but they are back this year, and apparently when they have come back, they still do not have messages on them. They're just candy hearts. Fact check that. That's neither here nor there. That's not what this episode is about, but I just thought that was interesting. But they're one of the other things that I associate with the holiday. Different people have different ways of celebrating. Uh, of course, like I have just previously stated, uh, maybe not in the full extent. Maybe you don't have a sweetheart, and it seems like the singles out there, they go even harder, party hard, declaring their single didness. That's not even the word, but we're going to use it here and celebrate sing Single Awareness Day, which it's funny because the abbreviations are sad. Whatever. To each their own. Whatever the case may be, I wish you and yours or not a happy Valentine's Day or happy Single Awareness Day. In a little town called Valentine Bluffs, they celebrate, or not really, in their own special way. <laughs> It 
it's a bad time this time of year how many times is he gonna tell this story don't let him tell it i love fairy tales this ain't no fairy tale little girl if you don't take it seriously you're a fool <laughs> Valentine's dance in 20 years has to be something special. Look, Landers, you gotta get a lot of exercise if you're gonna grapple with Gretchen. Oh, yeah? Well, I got a Valentine for her that she's never gonna forget. <laughs> right to the heart, huh? In this town on Valentine's Day, everybody loses their heart. Roses are red, violets are blue. One is dead, and so are you. It can't be happening again. No! It can't be happening again. What's going on over on Valentine Bluffs? It looks like Harry Warden's back in town. <coughs> It happened once. It happened twice. Cancel the dance or it'll happen twice. In the town of Valentine Bluffs, there are many ways to die. Take your pick. Bloody Valentine. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are going to be talking about the 1981 film My Bloody Valentine. My Bloody Valentine takes place in the fictional town of Valentine's Bluff, the little town with the big heart. We see a town that has been unable to celebrate the holiday of Valentine's Day without incident for 20 years, because in the year of 1960, five miners were trapped, killed in a mine explosion in Hanager Mines, because two of the supervisors left their post, excited to get to the town's yearly Valentine's Day dance. They didn't check the appropriate, or make the appropriate checks before they signed out and left, thus leaving these men trapped there to die. All of them died except for one, one Harry Warden. Harry was rescued and then placed into a mental hospital. And a year later, seeking revenge, kills the two supervisors, leaving a warning and a message to the town that this will happen again if you continue with your Valentine's Day celebrations. Skipping ahead 20 years, we see that they're taking a chance once again to revive the tradition, the long dead tradition of Valentine's Day by hosting the town dance once again. And we meet a ragtag bunch of miners. We meet TJ Hanniger, who is the son of the owner of the Hanniger Mining Company, his friend Axel and Sarah, the main characters in this film. And throughout the film, we see that once again, people are turning up dead, their hearts being ripped out placed in candy heart boxes to serve as a warning to not continue on with this dance. Ignoring the signs, the sheriff and the police force try to cover it up the best they can, but people keep turning up dead and there's no way to hide. We learn that a few years back, Harry Warden had passed away and was no longer living, so we're left with the twist of who did it and who had done it. And who was behind these murders? And that, my friends, is a breakdown of My Bloody Valentine, 1981. I told you this episode is going to be much different. Maybe I didn't mention it, but it's going to be a little bit different than the past few episodes. I just wanted to kind of give you a brief plot summary of the film and just some little points and some little interesting information regarding the film that I found and why I appreciate and like this film. So the movie released to theaters. In February 11, 1981, the picture was directed by George Malaka, if I'm saying that correctly. The budget for this film was $2.3 million and only grossed $5.7 million in the box office, which, you know, it's a positive 
ROI, not as well as they had hoped to do. The company that um, premiered this film or that the studio behind this film was Paramount Studios. So we had, we're coming off 1980s, Friday the 13th, and we're in a very young and early stage for the slasher film genre. Halloween being released in 1978 was looked at as the beginning of the slasher genre, though you can go back a few years and some like to say that Black Christmas was the kickoff. But whatever way you look at it, we're still in the infancy of the slasher genre. And this film, again, was panned by critics didn't do as expected in the box office, but as with any type of these movies, these type of movies, this genre, if you will, it took years for it to get his legs and gain a cult following, uh, which we have today. The film was filmed it's redundant in the Sydney mines in Nova Scotia. It was a defunct mine and mining town, and it was the perfect setting to carry out the story of Harry Warden. So after they had approached the town and whoever the appropriate channels are to go through when securing a location for a movie, and I thought this was pretty interesting, uh, the town er, decided to be very hospitable, hospitable, overly hospitable, and they went and cleaned and painted the mines, restoring them to a near pristine condition, which, again, the mine was abandoned, I believe I read, for like five or six years, so it had time to age, but everything was still there, so it was like the perfect spooky setting for it, and they went and made it unspooky, thus causing, which is funny, the crew to use their budget to re- do, if you will, undo, if you will, do a con good old control Z on the mine by making it look abandoned again and beat down, which I thought that was pretty interesting. They were trying to do a good deed, and I think the good deed was acknowledged and recognized. Unfortunately, that's not the aesthetic that they were going for, and that wouldn't have been very good for the movie overall. The movie had nine minutes, according to the director, of footage and film that was cut from the movie because of, in order to, as most horror movies, even still today, depending on the director, to secure a an R rating to make sure this uh, debuted in commercial theaters, mainstream theaters, I don't know what the best way to put it is, they had to cut this footage so they could obtain the R rating. Other than that, an X was not going to fly and not going to cut it and wouldn't have done this film any favors. Later on, I believe in 2009, they did release a an uncut version, which was still, some of the footage was restored, but others was still lost to time and legitimately left on the cutting room floor. And we see that because of this gore and nonsensical killings of mostly female victims, again, it was a stereotype back then, and that's the way critics looked at it. I mean, here, listen for yourself. Listen to Cicel and Eva talk about My Bloody Valentine. My Bloody Valentine, our next film, is another mad slasher going after mostly women victims, this time in a coal mining town. I'm really getting sick of these pictures. The movie starts right out by assaulting us. Even before we get to read the title, we see a woman in a state of undress get impaled on a pickaxe. Typical of the dull thrills in the movie is a scene where the mad killer stalks his victim in a laundromat decorated for Valentine's Day. Well, there's a disgusting new wrinkle in this kind of film. We see a middle-aged woman hacked apart. The big guessing game here, if anybody cares, and I sure didn't, is who is the crazed killer wearing the wetsuit and the miner's helmet? It turns out that his identity has to do with a killing that happened 20 years earlier on Valentine's Day in that same town. Gee, isn't that interesting? You want to see someone receive a bloody human heart in a Valentine-shaped candy box? Then you'll love my bloody Valentine. Gee, I guess I didn't love it very much. Was it only two years ago? We were praising a movie called Halloween. We thought it was kind of nice, had some style and wit to it. This movie is about the seventh direct ripoff of Halloween. We have right. New Year's Evil, Prom Night, Friday the 13th, Terror Train. They all have the same formula. Something terrible happens 20 years ago right. or 10 years ago. Then there's a party, and all the teenagers get together in the same place, the old train or the old deserted mine shaft or something, and the berserk maniac comes down on them with a knife or a pickaxe or something. It's First of all, it's disgusting. Secondly, it's so appallingly lacking in imagination. You would think that they could at least come up with a new disgusting angle. Yeah, I'm uh, sitting there wondering why these people get involved in these films. I mean, what do uh -huh. the women think who are getting pickaxes thrown at them? What do they think they're contributing to art? Mm -hmm. And I also, as you rattle off that list of names, I'm thinking of all those hours we've both logged in movie theaters, slumped uh -huh. over in our seats, just shaking our heads. Boy, I wish this trend would really end. Boy, well, Bloody Valentine isn't doing very much business. Maybe that's a good sign. Let's move on to a much better movie. 
We were both disgusted by my buddy Valentine, the latest mad slasher movie named after a holiday. Another two no votes for that one. So as you can see, Siskel and Ebert were clearly, clearly um, disgusted by the film. But it was interesting, and I would have to go back and watch this review. I'm sure it's on YouTube. They did not necessarily praise Halloween, but they did say they liked it and appreciated what they did. And again, because I guess that was the first one, I think Halloween does have that, uh, not stigma, because it's not a stigma, it's not a bad thing, but it has been known because it's not over the top gore, but it's more horror, like genuine horror. Um, the thought of this madman on the loose killing his victims, but the the gore is not over the top in that film, so I think they appreciated that more. Obviously, they state that than this, so it was definitely a no. They didn't approve of My Bloody Valentine, but other people certainly did, and looking back at the footage that was incorporated in, wasn't too bad, but I guess for that time, it was considered extremely graphic and shocking. But I also like the fact that and I didn't think of it, I said, I forget which reviewer or which YouTube video I had watched um, that pointed this out, or maybe it was an article, that the movie starts the day is February, Thursday, February 12th, and which would be Friday the 13th would be the next day, which coincidentally, in the movie, it was 1980, so that would have made it go hand in hand with the release of Friday the 13th, which was released in 1980. I thought that was funny. I thought that was interesting, a little interesting tidbit. But again, at the time, it wasn't well received, this film. The way it ends, they could have had most definitely a sequel to this. And I believe the director later on, many years later, approached Paramount with the idea and presented them with an idea for a sequel for My Bloody Valentine. But that was shot down because of its lackluster performance all those years ago. I'd be curious to see it. I if it does have a big enough cult following, I don't think why they want to push forward and do it. Uh, they did do a remake in 2009, completely unrelated to not unrelated, but not the same directing team wasn't responsible. It was new new cast, new crew, same premise with a few little twists and turns uh, changed. And I have watched both. I was going to do a comparison of both of these, but I just want to focus on the 1981 one. I did notice that they there are some callbacks to the original certain death scenes were kind of recreated in the new version uh, and also the who is Harry, the mystery, the twist of who is taking the uh, people out was kind of changed up a bit. But you have the same main characters in that one. You have, uh, well, Tom Hanniger and you have Axel as well and, Sa and the character of Sarah in there being the primary characters in the 2009 one as well. So it's definitely it's worth a watch. I, I don't I didn't find it as good as the 1981 version, but it's certainly worth a watch. Now, the reason I appreciate the 1981 one is because it's such a time capsule, a timepiece of early 80s slasher, of the beginning of the slasher. You can tell it definitely follows the same cookie cutter, um, which just only Ebert mentioned, a formula that like Friday the 13th and other revenge type slasher movies follow. We know that in Friday the 13th, Jason is... You know, not they're not paying the counselors, not paying attention to Jason and Jason drowns, leading to his death and ultimately comes back to seek revenge on the counselors and any other counselors moving forward who are not paying attention and who are off having sex or doing drugs or drinking when they should be paying attention to the kids at camp. So much like that, we have Harry Warden, who him and his crew were left down there by the supervisors. They didn't wait for them to come out. Explosion happens. Most of them die, all but him. And he goes a little bit crazy. And comes back to seek revenge because they had left to go to the dance and were more worried about that than the safety of their team. But it's just a green. It's it's just a grainy. There's just something about the film from that time, very grainy, very raw, very gritty. Practical effects. Uh, that's why the 2009 remake was a 3D version, and they tried to add 3D into everything, which it's cool, it's interesting. But there's just something about the practical effect that makes a movie so much better. It's so simple and relatable to who we were as a society and culture at that time and just how it was perceived, but a more carefree, happy-go-lucky time. And you see that with these minors, these buddies. They're all buddies, pretty much. Very, It's a very tight-knit fraternity that we have there. So it just it draws you in, and it's... 
I I'd say for anyone who likes the horror genre, if you have not yet seen my Bloody Valentine, the 1981 version, I suggest you go back and watch it now and uh, find it. I believe right now it's on Shutter. I believe you can watch it on yes, Shutter. I think. So check it out if you haven't. If you have a Shutter subscription, definitely worth checking out. That's going to do it for this week's episode of the Mind of Smoothie Podcast. I do hope you enjoyed this. Uh, it's a very rough episode, to be honest. I got it out later than I wanted to. I re- recording later, and it's out later. Uh, it was just a very tough week this week, but hopefully we'll be back and be more concise and better next week here on the Mind of Smoothie Podcast. So thank you for tuning in. You can find me at INC underscore smoothie on Instagram and Twitter. INC smoothie entertainment.com is where you can find different blogs, vlogs, and also this podcast as well. And this podcast can be found on iTunes and other uh, podcast applications. So I thank you for tuning in. I want you all to have a great rest of your day. Great week. Take care. God bless. Stay smooth. And we will see you next week on the mind of smoothie podcast. Once upon a time, on a sad valentine, in a place known as Hanigar Mine. A legend began, every woman and man would always remember the time. And those who remained were never the same. You could see the fear in their eyes. Once every year, as the 14th draws near, there's a hush all over the town For oh, the legend they say On a Valentine's Day Is a curse that'll live on and on And no one will know As the years come and go Of the horror from long time ago Once upon a time